So now the DeFi ecosystem, it doesn't need banks and it doesn't need big institutions. There's $2 trillion in value to flow into this thing. If even half of that flows into it, it's going to be bigger than all the banks. All right, folks, I am sitting down today with Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink. This is going to be a fascinating conversation, hopefully into uh, all things DeFi, Oracle's Chainlink. Uh, but Sergey, I thought we could start actually kind of a higher level to begin. You have this amazing view into all things DeFi because Chainlink is pretty intimately plugged into so much of the ecosystem. What stands out to you about just where we're at right now and where, where the entire ecosystem has come so far? Yeah, so I, I personally think we're very much at the at the beginning of all this. And if you just look at the very foundational basic numbers, you'll kind of see that 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 there's a very simple kind of arithmetic there, right? So if you're if you see two trillion, now as of today it's over two trillion in the cryptocurrency format, um, and you only see anywhere from eighty to a hundred billion, you know, in the DeFi applications there are. As a percentage, that, that's low single digits. So the percentage of value that could be in DeFi, because it's in the crypto format, right? It's in a Bitcoin, it's in an Ether, it's in, it's in some, some token that can be put into a DeFi protocol, is right now in the low single digits. And the benefits are DeFi, of DeFi are so um, large, and also whenever someone seems to become um, an owner of cryptocurrency or any of these tokens, they, they seem to invariably delve deeper into it. And DeFi has all these great security properties that guarantee greater security and greater, um, actually greater returns and security and transparency. So if we were to go from 4% or 5% to 10%, DeFi would double, right? And if we were, were to go to 20% of all, of all, of all on-chain crypto value right now, um, it would quadruple. Right, and so twenty percent of all crypto value in DeFi—that seems like a very conservative estimate to me. Very conservative. So, in that sense, um, the market dynamics and the dynamics around usage of these systems is is very very early. Um, the systems themselves um, are built in a fascinating way. Where imagine if if you have all these banks right and all of these banks build these distinct services for themselves internally right so you have like five six global banks they all have they, they all do largely the same thing and they all spend billions of dollars on building a single internal service that they can give to their clients so now you have six or seven or eight of these replicated services whatever the service is whether it's derivatives related service or a equity something service or some block trading thing or whatever so now they all have this, right? So there's eight variants of this, and you can go to eight different banks. In DeFi, what happens is that a single team focuses on making that service for everybody, for the whole world. And so that one team, it isn't the bank, and it isn't focused on 50 things to, to keep growing. It's focused on polishing that one service into a highly reliable, globally accessible, best of its kind service, right? So an example is lending with Aave, right? Kind of money market type things, right? So imagine if instead of all of the activity in the financial world being sunk into individual enterprises that replicate the same exact thing, the same exact like word for word department, word for word exact functionality, all of that human effort somehow flowed into one version of that service. And that one version of the service was then usable by everybody. It was usable by all the banks, and it was usable by all the users globally, and, it, it, and, and, and everyone just kept building that one service across all the banks, right? Whether that was a derivative service, or it was a block trading service, or, what is, what, or it was an exchange service, or whatever it was, right? And that's really what DeFi is in a certain sense. It's, it's the open sourcing and the permissionless innovation of the financial markets. And fundamentally, the open sourcing of technology has historically always um, ended up in a superior product to the centralized closed source alternative. 
And while this debate might have existed a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, about Linux and Microsoft Server, if you look at the market share, Linux is at way, way past 60, 70%. So Linux is the clear winner because it is open source and because everybody is putting their effort toward making one shared resource in the case of Linux servers. So I think what, what DeFi is, is it's very early. It's a completely different collaborative and globally accessible model for people to build and interact with the global financial system. And I got to tell you, the way the global financial system has been treating people over the past couple of decades, and you know, even small flashes in the pan like Robinhood or other things, I think people are very, very willing to consider an alternative model. And I think that the, that the people in the current model uh, have a place in the alternative model as long as they move quickly enough, just like they would, would have had to move quickly enough with the internet. But, but what DeFi is, is it's a very, very early stage version of the financial internet, because even though you might think we have a financial internet, we really don't um, until DeFi has appeared. And then it is also a completely new way to both build financial systems global financial systems, global financial applications. And it's uh, an entirely new way to also interact with them. And that interaction is very important because when you interact with existing systems, you actually have very little control, very little transparency, very little security, very little of the things that um, I think will become increasingly important to people as the world, especially if the world becomes a more unstable, unpredictable place. But you know that's that's a different, longer conversation. So so that's what I see in DeFi right now. It's a very early stage thing that is going to gain steam extremely rapidly, even if only only if the value in cryptocurrencies flows into it. So now the DeFi ecosystem it doesn't need banks and it doesn't need big institutions. There's two trillion dollars in value to flow into this thing. If even half of that flows into it, it's going to be bigger than all the banks. And so at, at the end of the day, um, I think it's an inevitable conclusion that as long as there's value in the crypto format and as long as DeFi delivers a superior and more secure um, user experience, which it does, because on a foundational level, it's built very differently, then um, even without external participation, DeFi um, is very clearly here to stay. And it's, and it's very clearly um, the way that a lot of even fintechs are now starting to build their applications. So... That's, that's where I think it is right now. I think it's very early, but I think we're, we're pretty much right nearing that inflection point uh, on, on this trajectory of adoption. But then again, I'm a very optimistic person about all this, and I've been thinking that for many years. So just, just with that extreme caveat there, but um, I, I think <laughs> in this case, just like in the past ones, we are, we are pretty much at the inflection point where the value of this is becoming clear. And the numbers at this point are proving that out very clearly. So I haven't been in the industry as long as you have, but I've you know, been here for, for some time. And I remember you know, every three months dating back, for, back to like 2017, every three months we would say the institutions are coming, the institutions are coming. And it took you know, several years for that to actually play out. And now it's actually happening. You mentioned this inflection point for DeFi, Sergey. What, what's missing from DeFi? Like when do we actually get to this inflection point? And I guess to extend that question out, how do you envision DeFi changing in the future? whether that be six months or six years from now? Sure, sure. I mean, that's, that's a pretty expensive question. I'm going to have to give smaller detailed answers yeah. that are pieces of the puzzle, not the whole puzzle, because that's a, that's a very expensive question. But um, I think what's going to continue to happen is that there's going to be kind of three layers of users. There's going to be the initial layer, the early adopter layer, which, is, which, which are the crypto holders, the crypto token holders, the Bitcoin holders, the Ether holders, all of these people. And their collective purchasing power or their collective you know, economic value has now grown to over $2 trillion. So I think that group is going to continue to grow. I think there's going to be a number of factors determining how fast that group grows, such as how much do traditional systems not meet the expectations of users. So for example, when Robinhood happened, there was a huge surge in DeFi adoption, big surge in DeFi adoption, big surge in crypto adoption. And as other systems similar to, to Robinhood that provide what I call paper promises and just trust us guarantee, just trust us promises, as those just trust us promises begin to fail in different places, 
people will realize that the cryptographic promise, the cryptographically guaranteed truth of, of DeFi is a superior alternative. So I think that that is going to keep feeding DeFi pretty much in almost all states of the world. Then there are um, general investors out in the market that are opportunistic and that are looking to get into, into DeFi and looking to get into Bitcoin. I think the very, very big difference for them is, is that before blockchains and smart contracts were about tokenization. They were about generating a token that people would, would hope would increase in value, right? So some, some token, you know, with some exceptions, many of the tokens were generated for this kind of speculative reason. Some of them are for utility, some of them are for NFT reasons, other reasons, but um, at least the, the hue that the industry has had up until now has been, that's where you go to make a token, and that's when you have a token, and, and whatever, you know, whatever the value of that is, we'll figure out that's somehow. Um, I think what this is, is, is like the e-commerce of blockchains, right? So tokens were the very first use case. They were, to me, like the unencrypted email of our industry. And they are what got a lot of people to understand and start to use the technology at a very basic level. And now DeFi is really the first set of applications where you can get value for anything, regardless of how much you like or don't like tokens or tokenization or Bitcoin. So for example, you could go into DeFi and you could provide US dollar stable coins and you could get 8% on those US dollar stable coins while still controlling them, not, not ceding control to somebody else, effectively eliminating a certain dimension of counterparty risk and while having full transparency about what's being done with them, the risks being taken with them, and how your risk exposure is being managed, literally on a second-by-second -second basis. Now, that is, 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 is unrelated to tokenization. It's, a, it's you, know, you, you do need to use tokenization as a feature, just like you might need to use email to contact the, you know, the, the e-commerce website in the early days to place an order or, you know, to get support about the order or something, right? People in the early days of e-commerce actually communicated over email to arrange certain e-commerce transactions. So you, you still have the benefit and functionality of tokenization, but DeFi is really the first fully encapsulated use case that can take the world's existing value, regardless of the value of any new token or Bitcoin or anything, and provide fundamental superior financial products to people all over the world, as long as they have internet connectivity. And um, you know, that's, that's something that I think that, that opportunistic group of people out in the market um, will, will slowly understand. They'll understand that, oh, I can get less than 1% at a bank and I can get 8% on the US dollar in DeFi. What do I gotta do? And then the question is, well, who's gonna help them do that, right? Who's gonna, who's gonna make those rails? Who's gonna provide those interfaces? Who's gonna do all of the infrastructure work? To, to put create the infrastructure that even enables something like that to happen. Now, the, the infrastructure work is where we come in. So we, we uh, provide decentralized Oracle networks and, and various decentralized services that allow things like DeFi to be built, right? So that's, that's where we fit into, into this puzzle. There are other parts of the ecosystem, like Aave, like Synthetics, like, like other, other kind of organizations that build the interfaces and the actual financial products themselves. And then, fascinatingly enough, you already see one team building a really, really great lending product, another team building another service, and then instead of either of those teams replicating the other team's work, they just use each other's services. So you're basically creating like this big global bank that the whole world uses, where you have the Ave lending department, and you have the synthetics department, and you have the other department, and, and you don't need to talk to anybody. You, 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 just, you just go and you use these contracts you know, as long as you have the right permissioning, the right identity, the right, the right, the right, whatever you need to have according to the contract. So the, the pace at which things can be built is just, you know, is just orders of magnitude faster. I think what's going to happen with this pace of building things order to, orders of magnitude faster, more securely, more with less counterparty risk and fundamentally with better yield due to the access to global liquidity is that um, institutions we'll end up seeing financial products in the DeFi format that are simply superior. They're easier to use, they're more secure, they have less risk, you have better guarantees, and the only thing you're missing is like the big beautiful logo of the 100-year-old entity that's gonna say to you, just trust me, it'll be fine, I've been doing this for 100 years. 
And I think that institutions, you know, they do see some value in that logo and they do see some value in those relationships and they do see some value in that. But they, I think they fundamentally understand that the opaqueness of the financial system in its current form even allows the possibility for 100 year old logos to 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 not honor their commitments or not become insolvent or 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 create uh, various haircuts and drawdowns and all kinds of things that they don't want to happen. And I think fundamentally, the financial markets are not based on um, relationships or brands or logos. They, they're fundamentally based on returns and risk. So if DeFi through this conglomeration of super high quality services with complete um, transparency, higher security through private keys, and you know the ability to be composable with each other to create these superior financial products, if that fundamentally offers institutions greater returns with less risk, these institutions have a lot of smart people in them. They're not full of dumb people. They're very full of smart, very well-paid people. And their whole job is to catch on to things. And I don't think that if there's going to be 8% yield or even 4% yield out there in the world with less risk than, than sub 1% yield, that the institutions of the world with all of their smart people are just going to, they're just going to miss it. They're just going to kind of like, oh, no, no, I'm going to stick with my, uh, with, with, my, uh, with my buddy that I've known since college. That's not their job, right? Their, 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 their job is to get returns while managing risk. And, and, and it's, it's a very um, kind of at the edges place right now. It's, I wouldn't say it's commoditized, but I think people are really looking for you know, where they can get that. So as usual. So at, at the end of the day, I think as long as DeFi has this user base of early adopters at the two trillion level, which it has, um, as long as the opportunistic people out there that are tired of getting screwed over by centralized financial products that basically don't let them trade, take their money, become insolvent, whatever. And then eventually that'll be the, the user base on which the superior financial products of the world are built and institutions will adopt them for the same reasons they adopted the internet over, over postal services. It's just 10 X better. That's it. You don't need another reason. You just, you just need the reason that it's 10 times better. And I, I think it's getting to 10 times better um, in the next few years. I think there's still questions around identity. There's some questions around um, speed. There's some questions around privacy of data, privacy of contracts. There's some questions about scalability of the underlying systems. There's a number of questions that for trillions of dollars, um, hundreds of trillions of dollars still, still are being shaken out. But I think the speed at which they're being shaken out and the degree to which they can be solved in DeFi is orders of magnitude better than centralized finance, right? Centralized finance is orders of magnitude better than paper, right? Digital centralized finance is orders of magnitude better than paper documents. That's true. And that's why they, they're so big, because they are orders of magnitude better. And I think DeFi is orders of magnitude better than centralized digital finance, because centralized digital finance maybe can improve 10%, maybe it can improve 20%. It can't make the orders of magnitude level of improvement that DeFi can make and that DeFi is on the trajectory to make. And that fundamental difference over that six year timeline or 10 year timeline is, uh, is gonna make the difference. And, and that's the same reason the internet won and it's the same reason Linux won and it's the same reason DeFi is gonna win. Sergey, all right, so, so many good points in here. So one thing I wanna drill into, can you explain for folks this permissionless aspect of DeFi? Uh, and, and specifically you said, in DeFi, you can build on top of what everyone else is building, right? If I'm building an exchange at Goldman and I'm building an exchange at JP Morgan, I, th those would be very siloed, right? And we might build the exact same thing with a team of a thousand engineers, but, but they wouldn't actually collaborate with each other. In DeFi, everyone builds on top of each other. So for those who don't really understand how the system works, can you explain how something like Aave might plug in with something like Balancer, which might leverage something like Chainlink, and how that is different than, uh, you know, if I'm building an application, I can just leverage Stripe or I can leverage Plaid. Like, why is this system better than that system? Well, realistically, it, it's kind of similar to the fact that you can leverage Stripe or leverage Plaid because Stripe and Plaid are distinct services that are outside of, of banks that are being built with a focus. And, and this is also partly similar to the debate that banks have about private systems or cloud. 
And then there's this constant debate that's like 10 years old where everybody, somebody's like, oh, no, we have to do private. We have to run our own system. And, and, and the other people are like, well, look at all these great features in, in the cloud. We, we have, you know, the cloud has matured to the point where we can use it. So, so this, is, this is a very similar thing, right? Just like before, you as a bank were sitting there and building your own internal private servers. And now you're using a cloud, except in certain cases where you need certain privacy guarantees, which you can actually get to a better degree with blockchains and cryptography than with, with cloud. Um, you're now saying, hey, let me go to the cloud because there's just such a focus of security and, and capabilities in these cloud systems that why would I, as a bank entity, replicate all of that work, right? Why would, why would I, as a bank, rebuild Linux? I wouldn't. I would just use Linux, right? I would just run on Linux, which is what they do. So it's, it's, really, it's really part of the same story, right? The story is, 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 is always, hey, nobody knows how to do this the right way. We got to do it the right way. We're going to build it ourselves because we're so smart and we're the best. Okay, maybe that's true for a certain period of time. Then what happens is somebody says, oh, there's enough people building this separately. Why don't I build shared resource that is, is just built to the absolute best specifications possible? And that's what cloud is. And that's, that's what DeFi is, right? And, and that's also kind of what Stripe and Plaid and all these other systems, and Twilio are, right? It's just distinctly focused teams, open source projects, companies that are focused on solving a problem, a singular problem. And that focus is very valuable because how are you as a mid-tier bank going to achieve the same quality as them? You're not. You're not going to build something of the same quality if there's a thousand person company just doing that and that's their entire focus and they don't do anything else. Likewise, for even the top tier firms, which is eventually why they switch to a lot of external solutions. They license them, they use them open source, they do whatever they need to do, but that's what they do. Because once again, like there is a, a very big amount of power in focus. And, and that's what DeFi is. DeFi, you, you know, like there's these, there's these diagrams of, of a bank front end where they carve out, like they, they make a little, a little box, a little green or yellow box around different menu items and they point to different fintechs and they say, this fintech is going to eat this part of your bank thing. And this fintech is going to eat that part of your bank thing. You, you know what this is? Imagine if you just took a list of the bank stack and all the bank departments and all the bank backend systems and services. And you just drew boxes around each of those. Here's, here's our clearing and settlement facility. Oh, okay. Here's the protocol that takes that over. Here's the um, lending and money market you know, settlement system and, or money market system. Oh, here's the protocol that takes that over. That's what this is. The reason that's tough to understand is because it's, it's a backend problem. So the, the reason a lot of this, I think, is not as intuitive is because people, th people think that what blockchains and DeFi is saying is that we're just going to wholesale replace the internet. That's, that's not really the case. What, what DeFi is saying is that all of the backend and middle office and settlement and all the systems that you guys have about how the world works is going to be on a blockchain. It might be on a private blockchain. It might be on a consortium semi-public chain. It might be on a public chain. It might be on a combination of all those, depending on how privacy evolves in our industry. But that's what it's saying, right? So you can still own users as PayPal and give them access to cryptocurrency. You can still be some, some bank and give people access to DeFi as, as long as you decide to do that. Um, so at, at, at the end of the day, I, I think that the permissionless nature of this is that it's not just crypto startups and fintechs. I think banks are going to be providing their user, user base access to certain DeFi protocols that meet certain identity and regulation requirements. And, and so then you start to think about, you know, what is, what is the stack, right? And the stack really is infrastructure, the financial products and services built on top of the infrastructure, and then the interfaces to consume all of those services. And while fintechs have been largely focused on the interfaces, what blockchains allow is for people to focus on building those financial services um, and financial products on the back end. And then the infrastructure powers and underpins all of that, whether it's because the infrastructure um, runs the contract itself, like on Ethereum, or whether if it's the infrastructure provides market data, the way that uh, Chainlink Oracle networks do, to various lending protocols and other protocols, right? So 
the, the, the part of the confusion here is what's getting, what's going what's gonna to be improved. The, the user interfaces, the iPhone interfaces, the website interfaces, I mean, there's a ton of people building those and, uh, and, and a ton of people should keep building those. And there's uh, some crypto first teams that are going to build some great interfaces and are going to capture a lot of user demand for people that want to consume. Um, DeFi as a back-end set of services and financial products. When we're talking about this being permissionless, um, we mean that anybody in India or you know Asia or Europe or wherever, they don't they don't they don't need to build that service anymore. They can build a fintech or an interface on on top of that service. And in fact, so can a digital bank, and so can a tier one bank. And I, I think that's where it's all going, once again, for the same reason that all of that um, effort and insight is being focused into that one service, right? So Aave is a, is a certain type of service mainly focused on lending. Other smart contracts are distinct services. And to your point of how they use each other, yeah, you can, you can kind of move value between these services and get the benefit of the different services interacting, right? So at, at the end of the day, um, I think I think it's really about how how these things can be can be utilized not only by crypto startups or fintechs but also by tier three tier two tier one banks all of all of them. It's just like it's just like the internet. You can just use the internet. Why do you use it? Because it's better. It's better than sending a letter and waiting five days. That's it. That's the reason. So Sergey, okay, so we're talking a lot about DeFi and think this sounds like this perfect world, right? But what are, what are some of the challenges? of building DeFi. And actually to extend that question out, I want to start talking about Chainlink. Where do oracles fit into solving some of these challenges? So there, there's a number of infrastructure level challenges that are still being solved. Um, oracles focus on creating a parallel decentralized system alongside blockchains that provide all of the functionality that blockchains themselves don't have. So blockchains are like these very secure um, computing environments that essentially change the state of, a, of an agreement. They update the state of the agreement. And there are certain agreements that can live entirely in blockchains like token agreements because all of the activities of that agreement are completely on chain in that private key sign and move tokens between different addresses. And so the only activity that, that chain and the computing system needs to know is who decided to move what token where. But for the more advanced DeFi use cases like lending protocols, like various other protocols, you actually need external data. You need ex certain amounts of external off-chain compute that are trust minimized. And you need certain external levels of cross-chain connectivity so that DeFi applications can actually communicate with each other across chains. Decentralized Oracle networks, um, which is what Chainlink is, it's a collection of decentralized Oracle networks, um, provide all of this functionality. So part of the reason that our industry has been focused on tokens for so long is that before decentralized Oracle networks, the primary things you could do with a blockchain were generate tokens and trade them or move them around and engage in voting schemes with private keys from single private keys or tokens as, as, as essentially signing mechanisms. Um, and that's why for many, many years, for about four or five years, our entire industry was really about making tokens and what was called DAO voting. It was called DAO voting. With the appearance of decentralized Oracle networks like Chainlink, and really, I think Chainlink pioneered a lot of this and is continu continuing to pioneer what's possible here, you have the additional layer of functionality about access to market events, access to weather data, access to sports events for prediction markets, access to um, any data out there in the world. The ability to do computation in a trust minimized environment that maintains certain amounts of privacy and you know, can just update the state on chain, relieving you of certain scalability, privacy and other cost issues. And the ability to send commands and tokens between chains. So all of those key three key functionalities are housed in Oracle networks, which essentially make up a set of what are called off chain services. You have on-chain services, which is usually the contract itself or the financial product itself that then interoperates with other financial services and other products. And that is underpinned by blockchains and Oracle networks, often in equal measure, right? So you have the blockchain storing the actual contract, making the state changes happen, but then you have the Oracle networks generating hundreds of different services 
about providing data to that contract, about allowing it to communicate to another contract on another chain, about allowing it to perform a certain computation that it can't or doesn't want to perform on chain for cost or privacy reasons. And at the end of the day, you, you end up seeing a large collection of services. Right now, we have hundreds of distinct decentralized Oracle networks. In my expectation, we will at some point be at thousands of decentralized Oracle networks. Each of them, you can think of like a distinct Stripe or Twilio or Plaid or Google Maps. Even recently, we did something with Google where we started put, putting weather data from Google systems on chain for insurance products. And, and, and so what you're really seeing now is the evolution from just tokens to all of these more advanced hybrid smart contracts that are composed of both the on-chain code and the off-chain service, which is, which is what a decentralized Oracle network is. A decentralized Oracle network creates a trust-minimized off-chain service that is then consumed by the on-chain contract, which in combination creates DeFi contracts, insurance contracts, global trade contracts on a blockchain. And without which you can't really have DeFi and you can't really have decentralized fraud-proof gaming, and you can't really have a lot of use cases that require things like weather data, market data, connection to other systems. That, that is the missing piece of the puzzle, um, kind of, we sometimes laughingly say, the missing link in how all of this stuff needs, needs to work together properly. So tie it all together for me. How does Chainlink fit into making DeFi what it is today? Sure, of, of, of course. So depending on the day, we power between anywhere from 60 to 80% of DeFi that needs oracles. That's similar to the type of numbers you see around Linux and other open source standards. Chainlink is a global open source standard for generating all of these services. And there are already hundreds of these services that have been generated. They already secure tens of billions of dollars. It's difficult to say because of depending on the day, anywhere from 30 to 45 to depending on the day, it kind of fluctuates. But there, it, it secures tens of billions of dollars. It secures a very sizable percentage of DeFi. And it is the primary mechanism through which a lot of data, um, now starting with Chainlink Keeper, is a lot of off-chain computation that needs to be trust minimized is, is being delivered, as well as um, with CCIP, the delivery of various cross-chain movements and commands. So what, what Chainlink does is it, is it creates an, an expanding framework for creating all of these off-chain services, decentralized services. And, and when we think about decentralized services, we just need to remember that there is a universe of APIs and there's a universe of other systems and services that have data and that have you know, payment capabilities and that, that, that have a whole bunch of stuff out there in the world, but they are unusable by a smart contract until you put them into the Chainlink format. And so the goal of Chainlink is quite simply to be the global standard for generating all of these off-chain services for data, trust minimized off-chain computation to expand what contracts can do, and the delivery of cross-chain communication across multiple different chains, actually expanding the definition of what a smart contract is, right? So initially, like five years ago or six years ago, you would have a smart contract defined by tokenization. So there was just one contract, just the tokenization, that was the contract. Then you added a multi-sig contract, and then you added a voting contract, and now a smart contract was actually those three contracts together. But nobody ever said, it's a, it's a three-part smart contract. Everyone just said, it's a smart contract. And if you looked under the hood, you would see actually three smart contracts, a multi-sig signer, a tokenization contract, and a voting contract. And then you actually saw um, an expansion from, from there. So before, if, if you define the contract from the tokenization, the multi-sig, and the voting contract, and that was what a smart contract was, now you're actually defining it as those three contracts and an off-chain decentralized Oracle network giving its price data to it and providing that price data in a decentralized, tamper-proof, consensus-driven way. And guess what? Next, you're going to be defining a smart contract as those three contracts and that data network and maybe a keeper network to do some off-chain compute tasks for the contract. And then, and then guess what? The, the definition of a contract is gonna, a smart contract is gonna expand from there. You might have three or four contracts on one chain, and then you might need one or two decentralized Oracle networks to give it different types of data. And then you might need it to do some computation in a keeper network to make sure that it's being maintained and run properly. And then you might actually need it to interact with contracts on other chains. So now 
just like a web app isn't, uh, you know, isn't explained like a web app is actually these 15 services that all interoperate to generate this one I input of a geolocation of a car and a geolocation of a user and the combination of those you know people into like an uber ride you're actually going to keep seeing what defines a smart contract grow in relation to how many different contracts is it made up of how many different off-chain services are those contracts using and actually even the fact that those different contracts are on different chains right so it's not even about hey, there's a single blockchain here and there's like five contracts on there and they use five Oracle networks and they use two Keeper networks. It's actually about there's like five contracts on this one chain and then there's 15 contracts, one each on 15 other chains. Maybe those contracts end up just taking people's money or something or giving them back their, their, their returns or whatever. And then there's those five data Oracles and then those two Keeper networks, right? And that's what the architecture of a smart contract is. So the way Chainlink fits into this is the continual provision and of more and more of these off-chain services, whether that's the provision of decentralized data, definitive truth about events, weather events, market events, whatever events, election events, whatever sports events, whether it's about certain levels of trust-minimized computation that can't be done on-chain through Keeper networks, or if it's through the cross-chain communication across multiple different contracts, right? So our fundamental goal is, is to expand what people can build as a smart contract to include all of the world's off-chain systems, a new layer of trust-minimized off-chain compute, and cross-chain communication um, between multiple contracts. Because that is, the, that is the kind of end state, that is the architecture that I and we see as being the way that the most advanced smart contracts will be built, and it'll also be those smart contracts that are appealing to those institutions for their tens of trillions of dollars in value. Because those smart contracts will have so many different ways to check for risk and so many different levels of guarantees that they're going to work properly. And they'll be accessible to institutions on so many different environments that um, that's when we'll get to a 10x improvement over existing systems. It's when all the capabilities of off-chain systems, cross-chain systems, an additional level of trust minimized off chain compute with keepers that focuses on DevOps and automation. It's when all of those three off chain capabilities come together, that's when um, you, you can have the environment in which you can generate those 10x DeFi applications. So, in the future, that's what we expect to happen. That's what we're very excited about happening. And really, I think it's a net benefit for everybody. It's a net benefit for society because of the transparency and control and risk management that. Everybody gets even the common man in, in his interaction with financial markets because it forces transparency. It's an improvement for fintechs and all those other kind of competitors competing against banks. And it's an also, also an improvement uh, for banks that can offer a superior experience to their users by adopting this. So just like the Internet was a net improvement for everybody, this is a net improvement for everybody. And uh, that's that's that that that's really what we believe. And that's why we believe that. That, that building this infrastructure is very important. Sergey, tie it together for me. So you've got these hyper automated smart contracts. It's a 10x improvement, like you mentioned. How does this actually change existing, like make it a little more tangible for me. How does this actually change existing business models? And then a secondary question off of that would be, how should existing fintechs, banks, and institutions actually adapt here? Sure, ab ab absolutely. I think this is very similar to, um, what banks are experiencing with digital banks and the APIification of the banking industry, I think this is um, a more advanced version of that. So I, I, th I think the way that banks and fintechs should adapt to all this is th they should begin getting prepared to interface with all of these different chains and all of these different protocols so that they can offer them to their user base. Of all these protocols, some of them will become global standards. Some of these DeFi protocols will become global standards for lending, for derivatives, for any number of other capabilities. And the ability to interface with that global standard that provides a 10x improvement in security, transparency, risk control, and all the other features that existing institutions want, once identity is layered on, once privacy is layered on, once some scalability is layered on, all of which is getting layered on, onto all this. Once you, you reach that kind of 
threshold of all those capabilities interacting and intersecting, you don't want to be the fintech or the bank that doesn't know how to do this, is the reality. Just like you didn't want to be the bank that didn't have email capability and that couldn't do a conferencing video call. You didn't want to be that bank. And you don't, you, you, you don't want to be that bank in this situation for the exact same set of reasons. So in my opinion, the only option that banks really have, once again, because of my um, almost endless optimism about our industry and DeFi and blockchains and so on, as, as shown by how long I've been working on these things and still highly optimistic, even just more and more optimistic as I see it getting adopted. Um, I don't think there's gonna be much of a choice. I don't think a bank can show up and say, you know, I'm not gonna email you, I'm gonna mail you. I'm gonna send you some letters about all this. And you know, we can't do a conference video call. I'm sorry, we don't do that at our bank. You're gonna have to call me on my rotary phone. Like that just doesn't make sense. So at, at the end of the day, the only choice that banks and fintechs and all these people will have is ad adopting all this. That's it. That'll be the only choice. It'll be that or that's it. Or like, you know, all your business will go to people that have adopted this. That's the simple reality of the internet, of mobile phones, of video conferencing, of all these technologies. It's just the simple, there's, there's no, it gets to a point where nobody's even, nobody's even gonna say like, maybe we don't wanna do this. When 60 of their users come and, or 60 of their biggest clients come and say, can you custody Bitcoin for me? Guess what they do? They go, they buy custody solutions. When, when they come back to them and say, can you get me 7% on my Bitcoin holdings? Your competitor can because he's, he's implemented integrations with DeFi. What are you going to say? Are you going to say no? You know, nobody's going to say no. Everyone's going to say yes. And they're going to pick up the phone and they're going to call their back office and middle office people. And they're going to say, put pedal to metal and get me DeFi access. And so what do I think banks should do? I think they should just get ahead of that. I think if you're a bank or you're a fintech, you should make some kind of investment in integrating with various blockchains, either through a single middleware layer like Chainlink or whatever chains you think you need to integrate with. You basically have those two options, either integrate with each individual chain on an individual basis, which is kind of risky because you can't really predict what chain you're gonna need to be doing most of your transactions on, or you could integrate with a single enterprise middleware layer, which is what Chainlink does. In, in our ability to provide all of these services to over a hundred chains, we will have a perpetual future-proof interface into blockchains generally, right? Because as all those services are put on those chains, and, and by the way, the blockchain teams that get those chains, those services on their chains, they really want to make sure that that chain link integration works properly because it means all of those services, all of those capabilities being on their chain, which isn't a reason they have to work with these banks or any of these other people. They just usually just don't have time to help them realistically. So you, you basically have two choices. I mean, you have three choices as a bank. You can ignore DeFi and then it'll come knocking on your door and you'll have to move pretty fast. You can integrate with specific chains and make a bet on any one specific chain. Um, and you're welcome to do that if you have very strong conviction about that chain being the place where you're gonna do a very substantial amount of volume and transactions. Or you could integrate with an abstraction layer such as Chainlink that allows you access to 100 plus chains with an ongoing system of maintaining those integrations um, and a single kind of access point to all of those interfaces so that your existing systems can interface with those DeFi protocols and so that you can interface with, with various more advanced smart contracts and eventually build your own more advanced smart contracts using both that interface and the various on-chain services from Chainlink networks. So that's how I think we, we fit in now um, and, in, and, and in the future and how the existing business models need to change around all that realistically. Um, I think my answer is it's inevitable. That's my answer. I think, I think that's a good segue into, you guys just announced this big, big project, cross-chain interoperability protocol, CCIP for short. Can you explain just what this is and ideally how it creates this more, you know, for lack of a better word, advanced DeFi? Sure, absolutely. Um, so CCIP is a, a global open source standard that we're building together with a number of partners, some of the top people in the industry and some of the largest TVL holding kind of um, CFI and DeFi um, institutions that, not institutions, but DeFi isn't really institution, but like DeFi protocols and CFI folks that um, need secure cross-chain communication and token movement. So CCIP 
the cross-chain interoperability protocol seeks to do similarly to what TCP IP did for various different disparate internets and intranets. It seeks to create a standard around messaging and around communication between different blockchain environments. And the reason this is important is because there's a lot of very interesting capabilities that different blockchains have that developers should be able to use just like they use an external service for data from a chain link network, right? So whereas previously the chain link networks were primarily coming to consensus around external data and certain off-chain systems or generating certain things like random numbers or some, some lighter computations like keepers, this is the use of those same hyper-reliable Oracle networks, which are now being composed of the top teams as well as some of the top um, enterprises and infrastructure providers. So for example, T-Systems from Deutsche Telekom, Swisscom, LexisNexis, a number of different teams are already, enterprise teams are launching enterprise grade chain link nodes and actively running them to, to process transactions and um, not transactions, but the, the consensus needed to deliver data. Now, um, CCIP seeks to expand that highly reliable validator set to the world of cross-chain communication and token movement. And just to be very clear, communication and messaging is really the foundational piece that CCIP provides. Other people can build various bridges on top of CCIP. You can actually build cross-chain applications on top of CCIP. Um, and, and the way those look is that the smart contract is now no longer defined as a contract on any one chain. It's defined as a contract on a chain you know, with the tokenization contract and the voting contract and the multi-sig contract and some other contracts. But then let's say you want to either provide access to your smart contract on chain A from chain B, C, D, E, F, and you also maybe want to use some of the features that those chains have for your smart contract, guess what? You can now do that. You can now basically make a contract on chain B and C and D and E and F that says, if you'd like to interact with my smart contract on chain A, here's how you can do it. Here's, here's an on-chain contract on chains B, C, D, E, F. Tell me what you want me to do for you and the contract will do it for you. Because the smart contract is once again now, it's not a contract on a single chain, it's a conglomeration of contracts on a number of chains. And on top of that, there's a conglomeration of different Oracle networks that are facilitating the communication between those contracts, the movement of tokens between those contracts, as well as the access to external systems. So it's basically taking the decentralized Oracle mechanism and expanding it now beyond just consensus around data to some form of minimal trust minimized computation, which is what Keepers is, and CCIP is the cross-chain communication and cross-chain token movement. And I, I think, and I'm pretty sure what this will do, is it'll actually allow more advanced DeFi that is available on different chains. So, so for example, one of the things you could do is uh, through, through a reference implementation of CCIP for bridging that we call the programmable token bridge. And this is something that Celsius, um, I think the largest CFI lender out there with over 16 billion um, in total value locked has already um, you know, publicly committed and started, started working on using. You can not only send the tokens of a user to a DeFi protocol on another chain, but you can actually send the command of what to do with the token. So you as Celsius or you as, as some kind of application developer, if you're building a cross-chain smart contract, you don't actually necessarily need to go on that chain and figure everything out over there. You can simply send your token and what to do with the token. For example, take my token, put it into this protocol for this much time or under this set of conditions, and then return it to me if the conditions below, go below a certain threshold. That is the type of command that you can send to a programmable token bridge. That token bridge will, will generate the messages as well as the movement of tokens to facilitate all of that. And at the end of the day, you will have used a smart contract on another chain with a minimal amount of development effort. And what, what that means is that all of the DeFi, all of the insurance, all of the gaming, all of the capabilities across different chains can now be stitched together into more advanced, more useful centralized applications. And once again, that's our fundamental goal. So our fundamental goal at Chainlink is to enable hybrid smart contracts to reach their full potential, 
by providing what we call cryptographic truth. So by, by providing cryptographic truth through these Oracle networks, whether that's about data, external payments, cross-chain movements, some amount of computation, our ability to provide that additional layer of functionality and allow hybrid smart contracts to come to life. Realistically, the way that we enable DeFi to, to kind of help reach the, 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 the capabilities that it has in many cases. Um, our fundamental goal is to expand what our industry, what the blockchain industry can be used to build. And, and, and that has these three fundamental components. It has the component of off-chain system connectivity. It has the component of expanding trust-minimized off-chain computation, possibly with some privacy dimensions, possibly with, with, with capabilities through keepers. And then it has the dimension of interfacing with other blockchains for use of their data, use of their capabilities as DeFi contracts on those chains, or, or whatever you want to use those other blockchains for. And as we continually expand what a smart contract is, what those smart contracts do for society and what our industry is known as providing will magically, you, it's already changed, right? Like there are people that have come into the blockchain industry, not because they're interested in Bitcoins or tokens, but because they're interested in DeFi. And so DeFi as an application is how they view our industry. And as more applications from decentralized insurance to fraud proof gaming to fraud proof ad networks to fraud proof global trade, as each of those applications comes to life through the combination of off chain services and various on chain components, it will again redefine the industry in people's eyes. And it'll get to the point, in my opinion, and this is what we, what, what we want to see and, and get to, is that every um, piece of value that needs to be trusted. And every agreement that people need to actually rely upon, which is the vast majority of agreements out there in the world, will be seen as needing a cryptographic truth component. They will need to be seen as needing a blockchain um, anchor, a blockchain state, a blockchain kind of condition. And they will also need to meet the cryptographic truth decentralized Oracle network condition because the more advanced smart contracts simply cannot be built without both of these. We are feverishly, kind of seemingly endlessly working on, 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 on delivering that second piece and, and to our kind of really ex excited delight and amazement, as we deliver greater functionality, these amazing teams like Aave and, and, and others, just they end up building these more advanced applications or Celsius that says, you know, I do want to do cross-chain DeFi. I do want to utilize you know, that same Aave protocol or other protocols on various chains to, to provide my user base access to the benefit of blockchains across different chains. And that makes perfect sense because it's, it's just a more advanced, more useful version. Um, and as long as we can enable developers and other people to build it, we can on a certain timeline see our industry become something that it isn't today. Something, something that defines how the world works rather than just a subset of the world about tokenization and DeFi. I really think that this, this industry will be how the world works on the back end. Ads will not be served without blockchains. Transactions will not be done with them. Global trade will not happen without them because the new standard will be cryptographic truth. That will be the new standard that people need in order to engage in a transaction. And, and once you, know, you reach that tipping point, you can't really tell people to go back you can't tell them, um, oh, you know, I know you're used to email, but I prefer letters. Why don't you write, a, write it out to me and mail it to me? People don't go backwards, right? Once you get them used to something, they just go forwards. And that's why all of this makes so much logical sense. Because when you look at the fundamental value of all this, the fundamental value is there. It just needs to be um, kind of polished. Some pieces of it need to be clicked into place scalability, privacy, more advanced Oracle networks, and the interfaces to give people the value of that uh, capability of all that infrastructure through use cases needs to be generated. But all of that is already happening in different pockets and the people doing it are becoming rather successful at doing it. So that just suggests to me that it'll continue to happen at only a faster and faster pace. Sergey, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, to say the least, your I would say your your excitement and your optimism is quite contagious. So I'm I'm rooting for you, my friend. Uh, very exciting to see what you've built so far, and um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Great.
Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Jason. Yeah, thank you so much, Sergey. Talk to you soon.